uh, Liz to join me on, on stage here for a bit uh, here at the beginning of our sermon. But before we get into the sermon, I think we need to take a, a moment here to address uh, the events of yesterday and last night into the early hours of this morning and to express our need to pray for Israel. Uh, for many of you, you already know, you've watched the news and heard the news. For those who don't, um, yesterday, while it was our yesterday and in, in the evening and in the overnight, um, Iran launched an attack directly on Israel. They have been fighting a proxy war using Hamas in Palestine, Hezbollah in Syria, and now they have uh, directly launched an attack on Israel with thousands of drones and, uh, and ballistic missiles. Uh, thankfully, thank the Lord uh, for technology whereby those can, things can be detected and uh, forces from the U.S. and Jordan and Egypt in that, in that region uh, were able to shoot down many of those missiles and drones. And what they didn't get, um, most of them were, um, were repelled by what is called the Iron Dome, which is Israel's defense system that, um, that shoots down incoming missiles and so forth. And uh, by estimates, they say that 99% of the attack was repelled and, uh, and shot down. This is a direct attack on God's people in Israel. We know Israel to be God's chosen people, the people through whom he has chosen to reveal himself to the world. These are his beloved people, and we stand with Israel. As believers in Jesus Christ, we stand with the nation of Israel, with the Israeli people, because God has chosen to reveal himself through that nation. They are a blessed nation, and we know that whoever blesses Israel will be blessed, and whoever curses Israel will be cursed. Now, in response to this attack, one of Israel's high officials has said that their response will be unprecedented. And so, I don't know about you, but that strikes at my heart. We know Scripture. Now, I don't want to... This is not me being prophetic, okay? But knowing Scripture, having read the Scriptures, we know that in the end times there will be violence such as this against Israel, against God's people. And so this could, and I repeat, could, signal for us end of days. And so it's mightily important as never before that we are ready. That our hearts 
are right with God. That we have decided to follow Jesus and we're going to do what He calls us to do because we are His followers. We're going to follow Him every step. Now, how do we do that? If you're like me, you kind of feel at a loss. I'm kind of weak in this situation because, you know, I don't have <laughs> global powers at my disposal. But we do have universal powers at our disposal through prayer. And so we, as God's people, need to be praying. Praying like never before for loved ones, family members, friends who don't know Christ. Who maybe know the way, but they've rejected it. We need to be praying for them to turn their lives to Christ. To get serious about following Jesus. We need to be praying for our national leaders to make the right decisions. We need to be praying for other national leaders to make the right decisions. We need to pray specifically for Israel. We need to pray that they will make the right decisions, that God will protect His people, that God will Strengthen them, have the resolve to do what needs to be done. We need to pray for the people of Iran. We need to pray for the people of other Muslim nations that up to this point have been chanting death to Israel. We need to be praying for them that there would be a mighty move of God that Israelis and Muslims alike would come to the realization that Jesus is the Messiah. We pray for people to share God's Word. We pray for people to preach God's Word. We pray for visions of Jesus to appear to these people so that they will know without a doubt that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus is the one that will save us. So I'm going to ask that we just take a moment to silently pray where we are, to pray for Israel, to put away all other distractions, to listen to God's voice and pray for His will to be done. So let's just take a moment of silence and then in a moment I'll I'll pray. Lord, we are weak, but you are strong. In our weakness, may your strength be evident. May your Holy Spirit well up within us. And as we sang, it is time to arise, to arise to the occasion 
and pray like we've never prayed before. To arise to the occasion by falling to our knees before You. Asking for Your peace. Asking for Your grace and Your mercy. And for Your revelation to be to make you known among the nations. Father, we do not know what Israel's response may be. But we know that every moment of the future is in your hands. We commit ourselves to You. We do this anew every moment of every day. Lord, we're confessing right now that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And we pray that Your Holy Spirit would reign. Reign in our lives. Emanate from our lives to the world. And may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <laughs> Here we are, Liz. <laughs> Let me just... Uh... <sighs> Let me just look in disgust at my office while my dogs are barking. <laughs> <laughs> ay, ay, ay. The, we're continuing in our, uh, our series called Explore the Core, where we're looking at the core values of our church, uh, those core values being transformation, authenticity, generosity, and shifting or flexibility, if you will. Today's title is entitled, or today's sermon is entitled, Grace is Authentic. Last week we looked at how grace is transforming. This week we're looking at grace is authentic. And let me just give you a little bit of intro to what we're going to be looking at, that in Paul's letters to the church in Corinth, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he's trying to correct some errors that have made their way into the church, all right? If you look at where Corinth is, if you look back at the, uh, uh, at the maps in your Bible, you'll see that Corinth is on this little sliver of land between two land masses there, and Corinth is a port city with people coming from the east and people coming from the West to do trade. And so all these ideas are coming from the East as well as from the West and North and South. People are converging there at Corinth. And so there are a lot of ideologies, a lot of cultures just clashing and converging there in Corinth. And all these ideas from all the different places around the world are coming into Corinth and they're making their way into the church. And so Paul is trying to correct some of these wrong ideologies and, and cultural ideas that are making their way into the church. And so in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 1, now he's having to say to them, Listen, I was planning to come see you again, but God has changed my plans. And he's having to tell them, I really did mean to come to you. I wasn't lying, okay? His concern is the integrity and authenticity of the gospel that he had preached to them. And so Paul didn't want the truth of Christ to be perverted or uh, corrupted by any of these competing ideologies. He wanted them to be sure 
that the grace they had received when they received the message of Jesus Christ was still authentic. This salvation they received based upon the grace of God is still authentic. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today and reading about in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. So if you haven't turned to that already, go ahead. And in the meantime, Liz and I are going to have a little chat. So, okay, are you ready for the deep, deep questions of the earth? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's good, because not neither am I. So, <clears throat> real quick, just give us a, a little nutshell idea of who Liz Cisco is. What do you do? How do you spend your time? Those kinds of things. Working and sleeping are how I spend my time. <laughs> That's where, pretty where, much where it. Where do you work? Okay, I work uh, as an independent provider. Uh, I go work through the uh, state and the department or the board of DD here in Williams County. Okay. And so I work with uh, typically adults, but not necessarily okay. who have um, disabilities, yeah. mental and physical. Yeah, DD being. Dis, uh, developmentally developmental disabled. Disabled, disabled yes. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So well, that kind of gives us an idea of what you do for a living and it, how your mind kind of works. And uh, Oh, no, you'll never get there. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Good try, though. <laughs> uh, I can't even figure that one out. <laughs> so <clears throat> let's, let's ask a, a more serious question here. Now, in your personal life, how important is authenticity? How important is it that people are authentic and that you are authentic on a daily basis? Well, um, having grown up in an extremely dysfunctional home, um, back then, <clears throat> almost 60 years ago, <laughs> Uh, they didn't, <laughs> things were different, you know, times were different, uh, the things people knew and understood were different, the way uh, people were treated, it, it was just a different different era back then, um, but it was, things were starting to change, um, but growing up as I did, one of the things uh, that I was undiagnosed with was PTSD from my early childhood trauma, um, but it has turned me into the woman that I am today, good or bad, <laughs> whatever, however you want to look at that one. Very caring um, person. And, and I am, and I'm also a, a people watcher. I, I prefer to watch people. I don't typically jump into relationships. Um, so that's not 100% true because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are some that I do, um, yeah. that I do jump into, um, but I've learned to be more cautious over the years because I don't know always to, whether that is um, from a good connection or a bad connection. So am I... Am I jumping into a relationship with this person because God is directing it, or is it because it's familiar because of the years of abuse? So eventually I did learn that I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> In my earlier years, I did not know how to do that because we weren't taught these things back in the day, and now I can help teach people to do that. Um, and so I really, I really enjoy that, um, people being authentic. That's, I, I'm, the word has been around for, for years. It's nothing, it's not a new word. Um, it has become a quote-unquote buzzword, I think. People are, you know, always talking about how they're authentic. And I'm just like, you know, it, it just, it rubs me a little raw sometimes. I'm like, <laughs> you describe yourself as authentic. What exactly does that mean? So when Pastor um, contacted me, and I, I was compelled to say yes. I, I didn't even hesitate, which is pretty much unlike me. Um, <laughs> but I just, I really felt like the timing was right. But the first thing I did was I went to Google 
totally love that better than grabbing a dictionary. Um, but the, the, the meaning of true authentic, authenticity is not false or imitation, real, actual, and it is also true to one's own personality, spirit, or character. And that is where it resonated with me. I knew the first definition, but the second definition sort of made everything make more sense to me. And so I've been thinking over my, my life um, quite a bit in order to get through this, um, or to this place, I mean, not through this, not through it yet. <laughs> but um, looking back over the people that I have connected with over the years, even in my early childhood, the ones that I was the closest to were truly authentic. And uh, they lived what they believed. Um, and then, of course, the ones that I felt disconnect with were obviously not authentic. Then, flip forward to teenage years, you know, hormones, you can't think straight anyway. <laughs> and so I went, you know, the, the complete opposite. I wasn't gravitating as much toward authentic people as I was relating to the people who tended to be more dysfunctional. Um, and so then growing out of that as an adult, I'm a slow learner, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I learn the hard way, and, and I know a lot of that is just who I am, but it's also the direction that God has me going. Um, so authentic, authenticity has become more and more important to me, not even realizing that that's what I was searching for, um, was people who are real in what they say, in what they believe, and in how they treat people. Um, many of the church families that I have been involved in, a lot of not authentic people uh, attended many of those churches. Yeah. I mean, th there, there were authentic people, don't get me wrong there, but um, it was, it made you just yeah. stand back. I, yeah. I quit, I quit being involved, I just, stayed back. I it's just watched people. It's disappointing, isn't it, to it, see that authenticity and... It hurts. Yeah. yeah. It hurts internally. Yeah. You know it hurts God and, and you think, why, why? Yeah. Why do these people get to be in charge and you know what they're doing yeah. when they're not in the church building? Yeah. And it's a good thing that we, are, we put our faith in Jesus. Absolutely. Rather than in other people. Right. Because the other people will, you know, they're, they're, uh, there's inauthentic, inauthenticity to some degree in all of us, but we try to be as authentic as we can. Um, at least perfect. that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, at least, at least we should be we should. doing that, yes. So let me just ask you another question then in relation to that. Um, how have you seen authenticity displayed in people's lives uh, here at Grace? The, one of the best ways that I can say that I have seen, because I came in as just a people watcher, that's all I was here for. Yeah. I was not going to be... Uh, I was not committed to being here. I was not, I was just try it before you buy it kind of thing. Sure. I, was, I was here just to see how authentic people were. And I, I not only was on the receiving end of people being authentic with me, but I saw them with others within the church um, and not just here at church. I see them in other places, um, and I don't get to see all of you at, you know, Walmart. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's usually where I run into everybody, or Goodwill. <laughs> um, so I, I don't always see all of you there, but I still see you there. Um, 
Special Olympics. I'm very involved in that with my, with my clients. I see many of you from here that are involved in that as well. And so that, that is part of being authentic because um, you are out there showing the love of God in the community. You're being the church, you know, and that's totally what Jesus came to do. He didn't come here to preach rules, regulations. He threw a few of them out there, don't get me wrong. You know, we have to have rules in order to live, but he showed everybody how to be authentic, truly authentic to what God says to you and to listen to what God is saying. And even though I put, I, I typed everything, I typed everything up for the, the definition, God wouldn't let me do anymore. He would not let me write because I, I thought, I'm going to be nervous. I'm not nervous. Um, and I, I thought, I'm going to forget or I'm going to ramble on. I don't know why anyone thinks that I do that, but occasionally it comes <laughs> out. Um, but God wouldn't let me come up with answers for these questions because he wanted it to be authentic. Yeah. All because right. The authentic, authenticity yeah. is there. Yes. All right. With every ounce of authenticity in you, let me ask this final question. Who is your favorite current lead pastor at Grace Church? <laughs> Boy, that is... That's, that's a that, leading question, that isn't is it? That is the toughest one of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate it. Let's give Liz a round of applause. All right. Let's get into Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Now this is our boast, Paul writes. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you, in the holiness and in sincerity that are from God. We have done so not according to worldly wisdom, but according to God's grace. For we do not write you anything that you cannot read or understand, and I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Again, Paul was concerned about the authenticity of the, of the gospel message in the hearts and in the lives of the, of the people in, in Corinth. And he uses two words here in verse 12 to describe how he and his partners in ministry had conducted themselves while they were in Corinth. He wanted them to remember that. Remember how I and my partners in ministry conducted ourselves among you. Those two words that he used to describe it are in holiness and sincerity. Holiness and sincerity. So what, what about this, this idea of holiness? The first thing we want to see is that God's grace leads us into holiness. Paul reminds them that, them that he and his co cohorts conducted themselves, in, especially re in relation to other believers, in a holy manner. Now that word that's translated as holiness, as we read it here, uh, in other versions of, of Scripture, you know, like I read from the NIV, there's the King James, there's the 
New Revised Standard Version. There's American Standard Version. A lot of different uh, publications, public, yeah, publishing houses uh, have their versions of, of the Bible. So other versions translate those word, or that word as integrity, purity, simplicity, impure motives, generosity, honestly, and in frankness. So just putting it out there wholeheartedly, being clear with the message, being clear with the way they lived. It was important that they were authentically true to the message of Christ, not only in their words, but also in the way they conducted themselves. Stephen Curtis Chapman, how many of you have heard him? Okay, you know, all us gray hairs. <laughs> he wrote a song in the 90s, which I know to some of you things feel like, oh, that's a thousand years ago. For people like me, oh, that just, that's like 10 years ago. Reality, 30 years ago. But anyway, Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote a song called Got to Be True. Got to be true. And it was his version of a rap song. And uh, he even says in the, in the song, uh, you know, I got to be honest, I, I, I like rap music and the beatbox groove. And he says, and I raise my hands and I jump all around. But he says, let's be honest, he says, I grew up in a state where the grass is blue. Yes, Kentucky. And you hear this little banjo, bang, 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 bang. yeah. He said, "So if it's got to be believable, it's got to be true." And the chorus of that song says, "It's got to be true. I've got to be living what I say I believe. It's got to be true, even when nobody but Jesus is watching me. It's got to be true every single minute of every day." If anybody's ever going to look at me and say, hey, it's got to be true. People are looking for authenticity, aren't they, Liz? And if it's going to be believable, it's got to be true. And it was important that Paul and his colleagues were genuinely living in holiness in living out the purity of God who was living in them. The purity of the God who was living in them had to shine forth in their lives to show that they were genuinely living according to His will. Their practice of holy living among the, the, the Corinthians serves as an example to these people. And it also serves as an example to us as well. Now, as your pastor, I don't like to get legalistic. I grew up in a legalistic church. When people asked me what our church believed in, I could tell them all the things we didn't do. but I couldn't tell them what we really believed. So I don't like to be legalistic, but let me say this, as your pastor, as someone who's also a people watcher, I see some disheartening trends in American churches among our fellow Christians. Unfortunately, it has become culturally acceptable to be rather loose in our alignment with God and to be loose with our tongues. All too often, you hear it as well as I do, people who claim the name of Christ who are also using God's name and even the name Christ or Jesus as a swear word. And that's disturbing. 
Because if we are truly serving Christ as our Lord and as our Savior, we ought to hold His name in reverence. James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. So that you know this isn't just Dave Sherwood saying this. This comes from Scripture. And so if Scripture says it, then I'm going to say it because that's my calling is to preach the Word of God. And so let me read this. James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. And just like a car that's out of alignment poses a danger, because if you let go of the steering wheel, it's going to pull to one side or the other, or there may be some play in the wheels, because it's not in a proper alignment. Just as a car that's not in alignment is a danger, Christians whose words aren't in a align, alignment and aren't properly aligned with Christ, also make for a dangerous situation. It puts our own eternal life in danger. It gives us a bad testimony to those who are around us to say, oh, he says he's a Christian. She says she's a Christian, but she's using Christ's name or God's name as a swear word. So what does it mean to them, really? And so thus, it puts their lives and their eternity in peril as well. It's important that we align our lives and our words with Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, there Paul writes, God did not call us to be impure but to live a holy life. We are striving to be holy. And it's important that we remain mindful and aware of God's grace in our lives. All the things that He has done through His grace to draw us to Himself. That's God's grace. For we are saved by grace through faith. God's grace is what even gives us the faith that we put in Him. So God's drawing us to Himself is His grace, His unmerited favor. All the th times that we've seen God work in our lives to save our lives, to save us from harm, to save us from bad decisions, giving us his Spirit speaking to our spirit, warning us. That's God's grace. So we need to remain aware of God's grace. And in so doing, live our lives in a way that is according to holiness, to integrity, to honesty, and purity. The other word that he uses here is the word sincerity. And I know we're past 12, so I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to get us moving along here. So Paul's conduct was, uh, among the Corinthians, was not only in holiness, but he was sincere in the way he lived among them. It wasn't just an act. He was sincere. He truly believed what he was telling them. He truly believed that this is the way he should live his life. Everything he did and everything he said was from a sincere heart. How many of you remember from your childhood the Dr. Seuss books? Okay. Do you remember Horton the elephant? Yeah, okay. Horton sat on an egg or hatched an egg. I can't remember the title of the something like that. 
Horton, Horton agreed to sit on an egg for a mother bird while she ran an errand. And then while she was out, she did all kinds of things. She went here, there, and everywhere. And all the other characters were making fun of Horton because he was getting used. He was being taken advantage of. But what was Horton's response? Go ahead and put it up on the screen. Yeah, okay. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. I think Dr. Seuss was trying to teach kids a lesson about authenticity. Saying what we need, or meaning what we say and saying what we mean. Being faithful. Well, God is faithful 100%. So we ought to strive to be faithful 100%. Scott Haferman, or Hafman, excuse me, writes in the uh, commentary that I use for, uh, for some Bible study here called the NIV Application Commentary. He says, Paul's decision to be transparent about his suffering in verses 8 through 11 of chapter 1, and, no, and now about his change in plans in verses 12 through 14 reflects a confidence concerning God's transforming grace that remains relevant in any context. If our decisions flow from an honest attempt to reflect God's work in our lives, not from the ways of the world, then we will not need to hide our actions or motives behind a cloak of secrecy, even when we're wrong. Even when we make mistakes, our sincerity in Christ has to be seen. Now, this kind of sincerity not only marked Paul's life and those around him, but it marked all of the... the all, the members of that early church on the first days of, of the church. Last week we talked about how Peter preached to the, the people in Jerusalem who were gathered all there and everybody heard in their own language and 3,000 people came to Christ that day. Well, after that, Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. How? With glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord had added to their number daily those who were being saved. That authenticity of their faith displayed by their glad and sincere hearts made the message of the gospel that much more appealing to the people around them. That's why they gained favor with people all around, and the Lord added to their number daily. That's why Peter, later on, would write in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, writing to the churches that were scattered abroad, he wrote to them to live such godly, or excuse me, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You see, even when they're accusing us of doing wrong, they know in their heart of hearts that we are being authentic. When we live true to God's grace, they're going to know it's true. Folks, it's got to be true. If anybody's ever going to believe, it's got to be true. We have to show people that our faith and devotion to Christ is sincere. 
to God's grace, it's very real. If you've experienced God's grace in your life, you know it's real. He has, he has exhibited His grace in your life time and time and time again, and you know it's real. As the saying goes, if you know, you know. But if you don't know, then you don't know. If you don't know Jesus, if you've not accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, you don't know the beauty of God's grace. You don't know the power of God's grace. You don't know how authentic this faith is. In a hymn called Like a River Glorious, Francis Havergal writes, those who trust him wholly find him wholly true. When you put your faith into Christ, when you put all of you into Christ, when you trust Him with everything you've got, you find Him to be wholly true. He's faithful 100%. Just as the grace of God is authentic, we in our lives should reflect that authenticity in lives that are marked by holiness and sincerity. And so the question we have, questions we have to ask ourselves are these. Is my life marked by sincerity? Is my life marked by holiness. When people look at me, do they see someone whose Christian walk and testimony are authentic? Folks, if that's not true in your life, then we need to pray. And if it is true, we still need to pray. <laughs> still need to pray that God will continue to be authentic in us and show His authenticity through us, that we will be authentic in our faith and in our daily lives, that we will display His holiness and sincerity. Let's bow our heads. God, You've brought us here today to hear from Your Word, and we thank You for Your Word that is 100% authentic, it is 100% true, and we believe it, and we gamble our lives on it. We put all of our trust in you and in your word. So, Father, help us to live out your word, to live out a life, a life that is holy, a life that is sincere, a life that is authentically Christian. Father, as we leave this house of worship, as we move from this building back to our homes or wherever we may be going, may your Holy Spirit go with us and carry us to wherever you need us to go. Carry us in your grace so that we can carry the light of your holiness and sincerity, your authenticity to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.